Hello, everyone. This is Artemis with the Uncivilized Podcast. Today, we have Dr. Shannon Eplett, Professor of Theater and Indigenous Studies at Illinois State University. Dr. Eplett, how are you doing? Good, good. It's great to be here. Ani Boju, Nin Shannon Indigenikas, Bawating and Dojiba. And what I just did is introduce myself in Anishinaabe Moen. So, uh, my name is Shannon Eplett. Uh, I am a member of the Sault Ste. Marie tribe of Chippewa Indians, and I'm happy to be here. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to have you on. Uh, so I guess the first the first big question is, who is Dr. Eplett and what work or ideas were and are important to his development? OK, well, my my background, my Ph.D. is in theater history and I lived and worked in Chicago theater for about 15 years and my uh, my research, my writing is really about the history of Chicago's off loop theater scene. So that's that's one thing. So I do, you know, straight up theater history. I look at uh, Chicago's theater history through a sociological lens of this theater scene really only started in 1969. It blew up fast and big. It produced Steppenwolf, John Malkovich. I mean, some of the biggest ideas and actors and writers in American theater today. And it's a vital, really interesting scene. And I talk about how and why it works and how it can only happen in Chicago. So that's part of what I do. The other part of it is um, in graduate school. I mean, I've I've always been Native American, right? So, and I, like I said, I'm a member of the Sault Ste. Marie tribe of Chippewa Indians. And our tribe just like t- over the 4th celebrated its 50th anniversary of federal recognition. So I am older than the tribe itself as a political entity but um the way it was always the way it was always put to me as a kid is grandpa's indian not we're indian or you're indian too he's indian it's sort of the rest of us are not and so i always knew this it wasn't a secret um but being indian in sault st marie michigan was not a desirable thing to be and that's the world he grew up in and his grandmother they refer to as the squaw which is you know a problematic term but she was the indian you know she spoke the language and made moccasins for her grandchildren tanned deer hide in the backyard that was a story they all seemed really embarrassed about um but she kept some of the traditions in the language and that was lost because they lived at a time where if you're too indian your kids are going to be taken away and put in school in a boarding school and you know they had a white last name and my grandfather had blue eyes and curly hair and didn't look very indian and that was a good thing and thinking through my family history there was always a real emphasis on you know make sure the lawn is mowed what will the neighbors think we don't want them to think we're the damn indians um because they had na- my grandparents had neighbors who were damn Indians, you know, had rusty car parts in the yard and an adult son with a drinking problem that was arrested all the time. So they never wanted to be mistaken for that. So there was this pressure to not be that kind of Indian, right? Or be Indian at all. And um, like I said, my tribe was federally recognized in the early 70s. And in the early 80s, my grandfather got his Indian card, got his tribal membership, and he probably did that for, you know, there were certain benefits like health care, fishing licenses, actually, I think that was the way in for him. Um, so he got his card. And then a few years later, like my mom and her brother, my uncle got theirs, and then my, me and my cousins. So I got my Indian card, my tribal membership, maybe my last year of college. Um, and my family, when they first got their cards, they were kind of into it, you know, and then It just sort of petered out like you had to renew them periodically or vote in tribal elections i don't think anyone was doing that but me and it's like i want to know more about this like um so i got into learning more about you know the native past in my of my tribe of uh, my family so um so you learn more you read more you know um In grad school, I came to ISU as a grad student in 2009 to get my master's in theater. And it was at that point that I kind of realized like, wow, there, there's not many native people with PhDs (laughs) with graduate degrees or that do what I do. And other people found that really interesting. Um, so it's like, okay, well, I can sort of foreground more of 
foreground that more, I guess, in uh, the way I present myself. So um, I went to, you know, I finished my, my um, excuse me, I finished my master's at ISU. That's a two-year degree. And then I was, I didn't initially come to grad school thinking I wanted to get a PhD. My goal initially was to get a master's and like teach at a community college. But uh, at the time, it's like, well, why don't you look at PhD programs? Just, you know, explore, see what you get. Um, you don't have to go. So I did, and I got several great offers. And the best one was from University of Illinois down the road. Um, and I got a scholarship for, or a fellowship for being Native American because, as you may know, <laughs> as you all may know, U of I has a very problematic mascot and a, you know, questionable tr uh, history of dealing with Native Americans, especially around that topic. So I got the best uh, offer at U of I. So that's where I went. And I went to U of I. Um, I had gone to a high school. I grew up in Michigan. Um, I'd gone to a high school that had a Native American mascot that's very much in the vein of Chief Alanawak. And I grew up with that, and that was just normalized. Like, that was the only representation of a Native person that I had. And I grew up having no problem with it, because you don't know any differently. And then, especially being at U of I, I was very conscious, really for the first time, I was very conscious of being Native American and feeling othered. I don't look, you know, I don't look Native. You get, you know, I'm pretty light-skinned and, you know, um, brown hair and brown eyes. But, uh, you know, people don't often read me as Native at first. So, but I was very conscious of being Native and... More than once, because I don't look native, people would, I would, I got into that conversation of, well, I don't think the, the mascot's all that bad. I don't know what these Indians are upset about. So, <laughs> like, um, and I was teaching, um, I would always, I was, uh, dur as a, when I was a grad student, I was teaching a speech, you know, public speaking class. You know, this was sort of part of my fellowship, or my um, assistantship was teaching these classes and I would always start the class by telling people you know I'm Native American just my background you know I'm from Michigan I'm Native blah blah whatever it was like in there with all the other stuff you sort of tell students on the first day and then one year um you by does the spring um unofficial right the unofficial spring break party which is a big bar day drunken thing one mm -hmm. of the bars made a t-shirt with the chief on it that said what do you mean I have to stand in line I have a reservation and like students would show up in my class wow. wearing a shirt and or other you know chief wear. Um, I did a sample speech for them because the, one of the requirements of that class was they had to do a a speech on a controversial topic. So I did a sample for them on Native American mascots and representation and whatever about why they're destructive and why they're bad. And so it's not like they didn't know, but they still show up. So in this. The content for this sample speech that I did, um, and you, uh, the town of Pekin, Illinois. Okay, so I go through all the um, problematic mascot studies and why this is destructive with Native Americans, and really Native Americans are the one minority that is primarily used as a sports team mascot, but there are others, and one of them is from Pekin, Illinois, and um, they used to be the Pekin Chinks. Yeah. And so I, and I had, you know, and it was, I think they only got rid of that maybe in the late seventies. Um, it's not been gone all that long. So I would show this imagery. I mean, their mascot was a person with slanty eyes and a coolie hat. I mean, total stereotype. And I had several Asian and Asian American students in my class and they saw I'm showing these images and they would gasp, you know, it's like, oh, like, how could they do that? It's like, it's the same thing <laughs> like you with the cheese. It's the same damn thing. How do you think I right. feel when I see that or any Native person sees that? You know, you don't honor your ancestors or honor somebody by dressing up like them and dancing around at halftime. <laughs> like, it's not an honor. So, um, right. okay, so throughout grad school, my research focused on theater history. And as a sideline and as a performing artist, I started to explore um, Native using Native ideas and topics in the theater work that I do. So then I come to ISU and I got very involved in, you know, diversity, equity efforts. I started teaching at ISU full time in 2019 when I think that year the um, anti-Black ISU protests happened. It was a little ahead of George Floyd. And then with 2020, it really 
blew up. Um, I was also involved in um, a faculty group about indigenous representation, indigenous advocacy, and then Tribe at ISU started, and I was involved with that. And I realized, I mean, I mean, realized, I, I knew it wasn't like I didn't know this because I'd been a student at ISU, but there is nothing for Native students there. There is no recruitment and there are no services. There is no um, cultural support until Tribe came along, really. So um, I really made it a focus of the uh, service work I was doing at ISU was Native representation. Yeah. So let me let me follow up a little bit with that. So you, you're obvious the the importance of representation, it, it holds something for you. Um, and so does this obviously applies to your role as an uh, as an academic and in the arts. Does this apply specifically in some way to the lack of how would I phrase this? So historically, indigenous or even non-white people have been represented, written, represented, and even acted by white people, right? So what is the role of representation of, in this case, indigenous people by non-indigenous people, you know, like in movies or in theater, when someone writes indigenous characters or anything like that? Um, what, is, what does that look you, like to Well, you? what does it look like when I see non-native people playing native characters or writing, <clears throat> writing native stories? Um, it's, it's upsetting and it's false, usually. A, a lot of times it is, the other thing that's complicated is often it's well-meaning, mm -hmm. right? It's, they're trying their best or they think they're honoring, right? At best, that's what they believe they're doing. But you're not getting a true picture. I mean, if you want to know something, go to the source. We, we don't, um, I, I've taught a, a course a year or so ago on minority representation on the American stage. And it was really a history, kind of an overview of how African Americans go from being, you know, represented by white people in blackface performances in these minstrel shows that are clown shows that are making fun of them, that are completely racist to, you know, you know, to where we are today, um, you know, so that evolution. And it's true of other minorities too. And I did this, you know, so we start with um, African Americans in that class. And then I sort of branch out in the story of how Native Americans and, you know, Latinx people, I, I tried to incorporate queer representation, but that's such a big topic. It was hard to fit into the course. Um, but usually it goes from parody to making fun of, or presenting as the villain or the outsider you know, white people presenting minorities, whether it's Indians or not, into, you know, people, minorities taking control of their own representation. And I think with Native Americans, that is only very recently, like since the 1990s, been able to happen in mainstream media, in mainstream, you know, film and TV. And with um, Reservation Dogs, the TV series that actually inspired a class that I've been teaching that's very, been very successful of, Native people telling their own stories um, their own way. And the beautiful thing about that show and it, other films <clears throat> and work that I cover in that class too is, you know, they're just telling good stories. And if it's good, it's relatable to anybody. You don't need to be Indian to understand reservation dogs. Um, when I teach in that class, when we start to get into reservation dogs, most students... Uh, the first few times I taught it, most of them had not heard of it, hadn't heard of the series. But I said, well, who's from a small town? Or who's from a tight-knit community? <laughs> and, you know, like three quarters of the class will raise their hand. It's like, you'll get it, right? It's just about teenagers growing up, and they happen to be Native. And they happen to live on a reservation. But <clears throat> if you're from a small town, it's going to make a whole lot of sense. So. Yeah. Yeah, I know, you know, reservation dog or res dogs is 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 huge. Um a guest we've had on before, Malatha, him and I have watched that show before. Yeah. And it's also one of those like you say, it has that universal appeal to or I shouldn't say universal, but it has a broad appeal yeah. to people of the coming the coming of age in a rural area that they want to escape they want to escape, but there's also in that a specific application to someone, perhaps that's indigenous people, or in some cases perhaps women. Or, or in some of the characters, you know, victims of neglect, right? There's aspects of it that can apply specifically to certain people of certain backgrounds or to a broader 
community of people, which I actually find really interesting. It's not tokenizing. So how much of that is because it's written by Indigenous people and not written about Indigenous people, if that made sense? I think um, Sterling Harjo and the people that write that show are from that. Most of them are from that world um, mm -hmm. of, you know, the reservation. They're from Oklahoma. Uh, most of them, I don't know how they, I can't say how they met exactly, but before Reservation Dogs, there was uh, the 1491s, which were sort of a sketch comedy group. It was all guys, um, but uh, there were about five of them. Sterling Harjo was one of them, Dallas Goldtooth, um, Bobby Wilson, uh, Ryan Redcorn. I think I'm leaving somebody, Migazi Personnel were the others. They started, and my guess is they probably met in college or soon after, or maybe when they were trying to start their careers. But um, they got together and started making YouTube videos, online stuff sketch comedy about being native because nobody would hire them they weren't getting hired as writers they weren't getting cast in anything they weren't working there was no place for them so they made their own um and they were able to do that because of social media um and eventually you know um taika waititi uh the uh you know director producer gave them a shot and he's the reason that reservation dogs got made um but he gave them, he made, uh, he made space for them. And so Reservation Dogs as a series took off. Um, and what I love about it is they are the, the, um, oh, Devery Jacobs, one of the actresses who's one of the lead characters is very interested in being a writer producer. She's a very driven person and she is directing episodes. She's starting to like support other, you know, moving out professionally to further that. So not only um it perpetuates itself right it's um one sort of generation of artists encouraging the next so when it's native people telling their own stories it's true and it's meaningful and you're going to get mm -hmm. a different perspective with with reservation dogs they're they are from a different tribal culture than mine it's very un you know it's a very um i'm anishinaabe where you know we live in the north woods um so there are cultural things I don't always get in that show, and I have to like Google it. Like, why did they? You know, like, what is it with the owls? You know, like, right. who's the deer lady? I don't know what right, that is. Right. But that I love that. You know, it's it's a different culture that exists right here in the U.S. You know, we kind of think we have one monolithic yeah. culture, and it's like there are five hundred and seventy some. You know, I don't even know. That's like the federal number of federally recognized tribes, but every tribe has its own culture. And even in, you know, my tribe, mm -hmm. Anishinaabe, yeah. there are differences from one, you know, community to the next. So, yeah, I find it interesting, though. Um, and this is just me and some of the spaces I'm in is this is particularly of like. Certain types of activists, typically, I've only seen it among like the white savior type of activists, but I'm sure it's among other groups is they love talking about how they mm -hmm. like that show, like out of their way. They. uh they say Skoden, and I'm like, oh, that's so cringy. Like, it's so, like, I get it. Like, you want to seem cool and, like, an ally. Um, and, you know, obviously the show's for everyone, this idea that, you know, oh, you can't watch it or enjoy or reference it because you're not indigenous or something. I'm not yeah. getting at that at all. But it's weird how some people, they kind of grab onto it for reasons I think they probably shouldn't be grabbing onto it. Almost, like, for diversity or, like, ally points almost. Do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, I mean, is. Um, yeah, I have I have taught the Skoden meme as, in my classes, which is kind of fun. I mean, what I like about one of the points I make is it sounds like it's a native word and it's not, you know, it's just let's go then and let's do this. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't really know that native people came up with that first. Right. Um, but it got pop popularized yeah. with the meme of a, you know, drunk Indian. Um and when I teach this, I go into the story of the guy in that in the meme originally, Pernell Badarm, who, you know, died, I think, about 2015 or so from alcoholism. You know, really, it it the meme started, you know, it was a picture of this drunk Indian with his fists up, you know, in a parking lot and the word Skoden. And it's really making fun of the guy. But then it became um, came to mean a lot more. And you see it, you know, spray painted on walls and it's in the background of uh, and they say it in, in Reservation Dogs. It shows up in other 
native sources too. Um, so as much as people like reservation dogs, there was another series, Rutherford Falls, that only got, I think, two seasons, and it deserved a lot more. And I tried to, I wanted to sort of like use that as a counterbalance to reservation dogs because it's um, set in upstate New York. So it's sort of based, it's not specifically, you know, they kind of make up a tribe, but it's, you know, a, a Mohawk based culture. Um, and it equally covers, you know, it's a small town with a reservation and a casino and the Indians are making all the money. This is like very much like Sault Ste. Marie, my tribe, where it's this sort of dying white town and then the Indians got gaming and suddenly they run everything now. But um, it kind of equally tells the story of the native community and the white community trying to hold on to this history and trying to sort of negotiate how do we coexist you know given everything um and it has a female lead character and she's kind of a misfit in her own community she's native and there is her counterpart who's a sort of privileged white guy that is also kind of a misfit and um and there was an episode there were two episodes one was titled skoden and the other was titled studis and what the show did really brilliantly in the first season was it set it up such that the white male character came to question his own identity. He found out he was adopted and suddenly he was not really a member of this prestigious family. And there is, um, in native circles, there is a lot of identity policing that goes on, I mean, first externally, but also it happens internally yeah. too. Um, the idea of like being disenrolled or pretendians, I mean, all of this. So, right. Um, yeah, it's, what I lo what I loved about Rutherford Falls was they made that make sense to white people. Made made that questioning your own identity, not being yourself enough or the right way. Um, they put it in terms that a white male protagonist could experience it. So I thought that was brilliant. <laughs> Sorry, I, I rambled. I apologize. No, no, no. You're good, but I think that's pretty typical for a theater major in my experience. But uh... oh, oh no, you didn't. <laughs> um. So in my experience, and we've had some people on this podcast that have spoken about this, uh, white, non-white, from various backgrounds, is they aren't all that interested in representation. Mm -hmm. uh, whether that's in artwork, it's in the private or public sector, they're like, oh, that just like dangling a carrot in front of us, so we're not concerned about XYZ issues or liberation or whatever it is that they're interested in. So how do you approach those? Like, have you had experience with those conversations or do you have thoughts about when people are like, oh, representation doesn't matter to me. I'm interested in, you know, whatever their conception of what a good life is or, or, or assistance is or whatever. Well, with, um, you know, good art speaks to everybody, right? Good art, art is about the human experience and it's universal and something, um, something that tells the truth um, something that tells the human truth is undeniable. I think that is my Angelou may have said that first and better. But um, what I like about uh, Reservation Dogs and other some of the other you know art that I sort of present in my classes is it tells something universal and emotional and true and undeniable. Um, a few when I was still a PhD student um, at U of I, I was part of. Newberry Consortium of American Indian Studies, which was a summer fellowship program in Chicago at the Newberry Library, it brought together uh, Native grad students from lots of different fields for sort of a summer seminar at the library. And at the end of it, we all you know presented our stuff. And most of the students there were in fields like history and sociology and legal studies, um, things like that. And there was, I was in theater and there was another a student in the program who was a visual artist. And we kind of felt like the odd people out because our idea of research and process and you know what can be done and told with these materials we're working with were very different. Um, so at the end of uh, this, this six week session or whatever, we all do a presentation on our research. And I remember the day I presented, the person who presented before me was a uh, guy who did uh, legal studies and he was native Hawaiian and he was talking, doing a presentation about Hawaiian uh, native land claims and the way Hawaii was 
sort of parceled out to non-native people and what this meant. Um, and it was done in like, you know, legal studies, right? Which is not my field. I had been researching um, Jane Johnston Schoolcraft, who was half Anishinaabe, she's a member of my tribe, and half white. So her mother was Anishinaabe, her father was English. And she lived from 18, she was born in 1800, died in 1842, Sault Ste. Marie, and she wrote poetry. She was a poet. She wrote in both Anishinaabe and in English. And she married the U.S. Indian agent for Sault Ste. Marie, the first, you know, white American representative of power in the area. She married Henry Rose Schoolcraft, who made his career out of writing about her tribe. So he is sort of the first um, ethnologist, anthropologist to look at Anishinaabe culture and language. And he used Jane and her family as, a, um, as his sources. And Jane gets almost historically got zero credit. Um, so I did all this research into Jane herself and what she wrote and what her life was. And I presented, like, I want to tell her story on stage. So this is going to be a play. It's going to be a performance. And it is from Jane's point of view, and it's using her writing and the way the world saw this woman. Um, but it's also about erasure. You know, she is a woman who lived and wrote and had children die and died of addiction, basically, died of a broken heart. Sorry. <laughs> you know you're I'm good. Saying? You're good. You're good. You're good. This is, a reason, this is a reason in Sunset that so much of it was written because it's hard to talk about. She wrote poetry. That was her way of writing herself in, into a world that was, trying, that was trying to erase her. And she married and she loved um, the man whose job was to disenfranchise her people. Mm -hmm. Basically, she loved him and um, he initially loved her, too, I think. But their marriage fell apart. OK, so you can tell this story on stage. Right. And yeah. I go through I do a presentation on what I'm going to do and how I'm going to do it. Didn't really do the play. And afterwards, this legal study student is like, am you <laughs> and I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, he's like, you can tell you you can show what it felt like. Like, I can do all the legal scholarship stuff in the world about how we were screwed but you can show how it felt that's what theater does that's what performance and art can do so that's kind of where i focus um in my work is showing how it feels or what it is um i've still yet to produce the jane johnston schoolcraft play um, i've done snippets of it here and there um but i've done other things and i've been able to work on other things along the way one of which was Sunset on the Longest Day, which I think worked better than anything I thought of with regards to Dean Johnson's schoolcraft with her piece. So, yeah, I think art shows you how it felt. And too often people just look at Native people as history or as a, a yeah. subject and not right. uh, people with feelings. How enraging, you know, being displaced and erased and fucked over, how enraging that is. And I think, like, I think empathy, actually, I'm sorry, I'll get, I'll circle back because you, you asked me kind of a specific question. I think that empathetic approach matters. It's like, you need to know how it felt or what mm -hmm. it might feel like. And then sometimes you can understand it better. It's not just about you broke all the treaties. Um, you did. But, you know, you took away our <laughs> land. You did. But think about what that might feel like, you know, the injustice of it. And to still have to get up and live in this world every day and still not see yourself represented or acknowledged. Um, watch, you know, living in fear as a Supreme Court uh, are rules on things that might jeopardize your children or your land or your rights. Um, so, yeah, I think art does that. Maybe better than anything else. If it's good. And if it's by natives. I mean, <laughs> yeah. so, so art. So for you, it's not representation for representation's sake, because there are surely there are people, oh, representation is its own end. But for you, it's more of a means to something greater. It, it's both. Yeah. I mean, I get, uh, you know, any good. Yeah, this is the thing we all like to. We're all still little kids and we like to hear a good story, you know. Mm -hmm. So that never goes away. And that's good. That's what makes us human. When I teach uh, theater history, my uh, disclaimer at the beginning of the semester is, you know, we're going to, and teaching theater history, it's very hard to incorporate Native content into that because 
there's so little of it. But, um, you know, there's other, I'm trying, you know, I need to try to represent, you know, women in this story that's usually very white and non-white people in theater history. But I say, you know, we're going to read plays that are going to upset you, you know, that are going to challenge your thinking and seem unjust. And fair warning, you know, there's going to be things that distress you. But this is art and we're artists. And sometimes art deals with the ugly side of things as, as its subject and one theory about art is that it's a way for us to uh, engage with these things, to imagine them or deal with them in a way that nobody gets hurt, right? It's not real, it's art. Uh, so right. I think that's important. So that any, uh, you know, I do believe in, you know, native, telling native stories and getting that out there and supporting native artists, but any good story that engages people, you know, that makes you feel something that tears you up, you know? Um, I just finished, yeah. we just finished watching the series The Bear last night, which is about, you know, a restaurant, um, this Italian American family running a restaurant. And like, by the end of it, and it's set in Chicago. So like, there's lots of, you know, nostalgia there, because I lived in Chicago for so long. But, um, you know, it's a world that's pretty foreign to me. I don't know much about the restaurant world. But, um, you know, it's, it just tore me up at the end. Um, which is good. Uh, it made me feel something. So it's a good mm -hmm. story. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I really, I want to get to one of your specific projects, Sunset on the Longest yeah. Day. Uh, I drove out there. Uh, I was there. Um, and it was great. I want to say it was, it was fucking awesome, yeah. by the way. Um, it was really great. Something I noticed, because um, I, I want to ask your interpretation and what the thought process yeah. was. So we'll, we'll actually have you talk about that first, because if I talk about it, it won't make any sense without context. So can we talk about what that project was or is, I suppose? Yeah, so that, um, the way this came up, um, the way this project evolved is Ruth K. Burke, who is a faculty in the art department at ISU, and she teaches video art. That's actually what she's doing at ISU, but she does, her practice as an artist is, um, land art or um, land I she doesn't like the term landscape art I guess there are some you know in her field there's some problematic history with that so but uh earthworks or I think that's the term they don't like but this is what she does and she works with animal labor and when she first told me animal labor I'm like what do you mean animal labor and she's like well like horses and oxen and you know and I start laughing but she worked she has a pair of oxen Clark and Sparky and she uses them in creating these earthworks. And she's also done things that involve horse labor too. So she wanted to do a piece about land acknowledgement and uh, un sort of uh, indigenous plants and the prairie, the idea of the prairie. So she, I had done a presentation on campus about land acknowledgement at ISU. And she approached me afterwards and sort of said like i want to do this thing i have space at the horticulture center out on rab road an acre of land to do with what i want and i want to do a piece that is a living land acknowledgement what does that look like native person i want native <laughs> input so we we started meeting and um my back you know uh my field is theater and performance and my tribe is you know we're the chippewa and Anishinaabe. Ojibwe, all one and the same. But um, I talked through our, like our tribal flag and the idea of the medicine wheel. And I said, it should whatever this thing is, it should probably be round. That is like, you know, very primal. And we have four medicine plants uh, in our sort of tradition, you know, sage, cedar, sweetgrass, and tobacco. And I think by that point, I had been out to the, the horticulture center and I could smell sweetgrass. So sweetgrass is just, it just looks like, grass like it's really hard to identify on site because it just there's nothing remarkable about it but it has this beautiful smell and in my tribe and a lot of traditions you you cut it and braid it into braids and dry it and you can burn it and you get the beautiful smell or sometimes people just keep braids of sweet grass around uh, but i knew it was growing out at the um horticulture center so i said like this piece whatever it is you know it should incorporate maybe some of these traditional plants but i don't know i think you should check with like the peoria miami and kickapoo tribe and see if those they're the people that it, this was their land so maybe what was holy to them 
you know, or what sort of gardening practices or agricultural practices did they do? Because my tribe really didn't. Uh, we were hunters and gatherers primarily. So this conversation started there. And I started talking about circles and maybe this could be a mound or a circular thing. And I said, well, you know, the, and then she was talking about like the, how the oxen could do this, right? At one point I said, it would be cool if it were sort of like a circular mound, like a big donut where you could stand in the middle and then with, and not see the stuff around you, just see like earth and sky, right? If it were mm -hmm. just deep enough. So we kind of, you know, pondered that. And I said, well, you know, the first theater performance spaces were threshing floors. You know, it was grain threshing. It was this hard circular area where they would either with animals or with people like beat the grain, you know, into, you know, flour or whatever. I'm not, not an agricultural person, but, but it's like, that's the theory is sort of, you know, the ancient theaters were kind of agricultural spaces to begin with. So then Ruth is like, why don't you just do a performance? And I'm like, oh. Okay, so her, her piece is called Domestic Rewilding, and what it is, or what it will be, is sort of a horseshoe shape. So it's a semicircle that's open to the east, and it's a mound. It'll be a sort of semicircular mound planted with um, native grasses. It's meant to favor pollinator species. Um, in the center, there may be, they're trying to have a sculpture by a native artist. She has somebody in mind. So it'll be this space um, out of Horticulture Center that is a living land acknowledgement. And then Ruth's goal, she has sort of like a five-year, I think, lease on this acre of land, is she wants to get the university to deed it back to, or seed it back, land back it to a tribe. Um, probably that will not happen, but that's sort of the goal. So it's a living land acknowledgement. The performance piece I did, so she said, why don't you just do a performance? I'm like, okay. So initially, I think it was going to be, we picked the summer solstice because that's significant in lots of ways. It's the longest day of the year. And I thought, well, what would this be? And it's like, well, there should be a fire. And there should be, I thought, like eight native people. And the reason it was eight native people was I could think of eight native people that might that I know that might come out and do this. So that was kind of the basis. but. Um, people standing at each of the cardinal directions, so north, south, east, west, and the you know, northwest, southwest. And they're around this fire, and they're holding signs. And the signage, so they have a series of, um, they each have like a pad of paper with a single word on it, and together it spells out phrases. And the phrases, I wrote them out because these were things I have trouble saying. I get too upset and emotional. But, um, you know, it's like, you took our land, you took our children, we are still here. So they go through a series of seven sign changes. So every 30 seconds, they pull off the top sheet and throw it in the fire. And in rehearsal, we discovered, I just thought you tear off the sheet, put the whole sheet in the fire. The problem is either it doesn't catch fire or it does and it starts to take off into the air. So uh, Ruth noticed, she's like, well, just crumple it up. You know, crumple the paper into a ball, throw it in the fire. And there's no way to do that without it seeming angry. You know, someone balls up a piece of paper. But it was like, man, that is effective. And it burns great. Yeah. Um, and I didn't give the performers any direct. It's like, just put it, make a ball out of it, put it in the fire. I didn't, I didn't ask them to act anything. Most of them were not performers to begin with. So they have these signs. And then at intervals, after seven sign changes, a person in the circle speaks. And they were each... Um, it starts with the East because in Ojibwe tradition, that's the beginning, right? Things start in the East and travel around. So it went, you know, East to South around the circle that way, clockwise. Um, the first question was, who are your people? And the person that was standing in the East, they just, there was no prompt for the question. So the audience didn't hear the question. They just got the answer. And that is because... <laughs> Nobody asks Indians anything. So these are the, <laughs> we're answering the question y'all didn't ask. And the person that had that question, mm -hmm. they could answer it any way they wanted to. Like, who are your people? If it means talking about your family, great. If it's uh, the history of your tribe, that's great too. Many Native people are uh, connected to more than one tribe. However you want to answer it. So it was, who are your people? What happened to them? Where are they now? 
these were the different questions. Do you know your language? Do you know your your spiritual tradition, your your religion, your traditional religion? How do you feel about this? Uh, how do you know this history? And I thought like my answer to that is gonna be different than the person that gave it, but um, you know, it was as an adult, I had to learn this history. My family didn't really wanna talk about it or didn't know it. So how was it passed on to you? And then the final question was, um, how do you feel about the future? So, um, and then the audience, yeah. the viewers for this, like I said, it's a bunch of people standing around a circle, facing the fire, the signs are facing inwards. And the performers were not miked. And they also were not, and they're outdoors and they're not experienced, most of them are not experienced public speakers. So I was really worried about people being heard. And the best direction I gave them was, you're talking, direct this so that the person across the fire from you can hear it. And when the people showed up, you know, we had one rehearsal and performance. Um, the crowd has to move around the piece in order to read the signs and see what's going on. And then when people, when the performers were talking, really they had to stop and kind of lean in to hear. And at the end of this, um, after we've gone around the circle, Ruth and her team of oxen started making their first transit of the space. Um, and they're wearing bells that came from Conestoga wagons, oh. which were the sort of, you know, prairie schooner wagons that crossed, you know, the prairie in the first place. And we had um, William Buckholtz Allison, who's a traditional flute player. He played while people were speaking, so there was musical underscoring. It was great. Um, the action of the crowd, the people having to move around the piece, put you in it, put, put the spectators in it, and made them complicit. And I think it made the viewer, and maybe you were a viewer, so maybe you could talk about this, but you were circling, it was like from the old Westerns where the Indians are circling the settlers, you know, attacking. That's what it felt like. In rehearsal, I, did, I had to walk yeah. around and it felt like I'm stalking the performers. It was very discomforting to me and I knew what it was. And then when it was time to listen, everyone had to stop and like listen. <laughs> so, um, yeah, mm -hmm. I've gotten some really good feedback from people on it. Um, so, yeah, does does that cover what you were asking? Okay. Yeah, yeah, I think I thought that was really great. Something you said when you were doing kind of like the introduction to everything that night. Remember, you said you might not yeah. he read or hear everything, and that's okay because th that's implicitly what it means to be indigenous <laughs> to not be heard or seen whenever you want to be, right? But here's the thing: is that's very clearly the point, right? Um, or part of it, not the point, but part of it. But then I'm there and I see people like stepping into the circle. They're leaning in. They're kind of like touching the performers. They kind of like turn them and i'm like you're proving the fucking point <laughs> this is why it's necessary which is it's crazy to me that these people show up for indigenous people as to them you know another yeah. thing to be viewed right but they're not engaging with it and it's funny because i was talking about this to to an indigenous person that that, it, that was part of it and they're like N that's not a bad they said well it's not such a bad thing because at least it proves yeah. their point you know, and I was just, it blew me away. I was like, ha you know, like I was, you know, I wanted to read and see everything, but I was also partially reporting it for someone involved. Um, but so I couldn't see or read everything. I'm okay with that. But some people were very, very incessant that they had to be, they had to yeah. see and well, hear everything. Yeah. And know? I'm, my background it, is, you know, directing in theater, you know, which is very, it, Viewing a play, you know, we always talk about the liveness of theater is its beautiful thing. You know, its salient quality is that it's live. It's not a movie. It'll never be the same again. You had to be there, but it's very passive. I mean, you sit in a dark theater and you <clears throat> stare at people on a stage and you don't talk and you don't acknowledge the people around you. You don't really interact with anyone else. So this and everything is directed made um accessible and clear and understandable and audible and all of that good stuff for you so we're so used to as an audience member being pandered to like that and this made you fucking work for it right like you got to get up and move to read it no we're not going to turn mm -hmm. around there was a printout of the text um that was uh you know i i did i did that 
funny that people had it in their hands, but right. they didn't look long enough yeah. at it to realize it's what it was there. I realized kind of late in the game, it's like, well, if someone, you know, right, it, I needed to do that. So, um, or hearing the performers, and that was a real concern. I did try to use an amplifier, like a vo uh, like this awful voice amp mm -hmm. thing that just did not work like let's just forget it it's better to not hear some of it but um you know it made you work to hear it and get it i think that's important and it made the audience part of it you know and everybody's experience of it is going to be different and that's something to talk about um how you felt and if i've yeah. thought about you know could i do this sort of thing again somewhere else in a different context and you know there i i could but it would not be it definitely would not be the same <laughs> Like, so what I liked about it was, yeah, it was all about the relationship of the uh, viewers and performers, the spectators and the performers, and everyone's experience of it was different and incomplete. But um, you got the gist of it. You didn't need to read every sign to figure it out. Um, there was some repetition going on. <laughs> and I didn't know, and I could not, on the performance night, I couldn't hear what the performers were saying most of the time because I was far enough away trying to cue things. So I'm still waiting to get a video of it so that I hear what they said. <laughs> um, but I loved it. I, mm -hmm. We did one rehearsal um, the night before and a lot of them, they didn't say much. You know, it's like they'd kind of get to their point where they're supposed to talk and they'd say a few things and then they go, you know, I'll have more tomorrow. They kind of had to think about it. And then performance night, man, some of them went on and on, which was great. But, um, yeah, I'm really proud of how it turned out. It definitely got emotional at parts as well. You know, some people involved are, yeah. for Ledbury were very stoic about their expressions. Yeah. And others, you know, there there were tears. Um, and I'm, I myself am, am, am not very emotional yeah. and that kind of stuff. That's but I was good. like, oh, shit. Oh, God. I was... And I realized, like, <laughs> it probably, pro oh. I, you know, I knew it would you know? provoke discomfort and unsettlement um, in who saw it and that was intentional i'm not um as an artist i mean i do like things that challenge people but in theater there's a sort of tradition of you know agitation propaganda theater or tolt brecht the way that's his work is i really like what he does i love his plays but i usually hate how they get produced um but there is this very tendency to be in your face mm -hmm. aggressive and what even if I agree with the message, sometimes I shut down to that. It's like, oh, please, you know, you're an actor. <laughs> you know, like, you know. Um, so there's something, uh, yeah, I don't always like real aggressive agitprop in your face kinds of things on stage. And this is that, but it also did it, I think I threaded a needle where it, you could feel how you wanted to feel about it. Yeah. The, th the statements in the piece, I wrote all of that. I think if I did this again, I would want to work with a community in writing the text. But I wrote that, and I struggled with it a lot. Um, what do I want to say? And it has to fit in, like, a sentence that's no longer than eight words. And it can't be too repetitive. Um, so I had to kind of stick yeah. to things that you couldn't really argue with, right? You took our children. You took our language. We cut our hair and threw away our moccasins. You know, we... Now, there's no ambiguity about any of that stuff you know it's just historical yeah it's like you can't argue i've had people argue like well do you, you call it a genocide but it's like don't you don't want to debate me on that <laughs> like if you're debating whether it's a genocide it's probably a genocide right it's one of those it, when you have to ask you know when you have to ask do i have to ask this you probably know the answer to your own question yeah but i get it like these so you're, you're appealing only to what is there is no interpretation about it. It is just what it is. Like, this happened. Yeah, it, it was factual. And, you know, I had some references to... Uh, there's a part in the text where I talk about moments where Native people stood up and fought back and it made history or it got attention. Things like Standing Rock. And some of the things I referenced, you know, people were like, what, what is that? What is Oka? Uh, which was a standoff in uh, Montreal or near Montreal in the 90s between the Mohawks and Indian government. Was that the one about uh, the government? Was that the one about the golf course development? Yes. What, yes. Okay. It's yeah. that. Okay. And I didn't know much about it. I taught a film in my Native Studies class called Beans 
that is amazing. People should see it, but it is by the filmmaker Tracy Deer. It came out, I think, two years ago. And it's about a 12 year old girl who's growing up in the midst of that. And part of it is the Oka crisis and what it was and how her family, you know, her parents were involved in it and what she witnessed. But the other half of it is just, you know, the stuff a teenage girl goes through, you know, falling in love for the first time or trying, you know, trying alcohol, getting drunk for the first time, you know. Um, so it's this coming of age story, but it's amazing. Um, so, and what I like teaching about that movie is, you know, we're a teenage girl <laughs> in this room. How many of you were a teenager? All of us, you know, we all fell in love the first time and got our heart broken and disobeyed our parents and wore something mom didn't like. And, you know, right. so that's relatable. Right. And then there's this historical event. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, so someone said, well, what is Oka? And it's like, go look it up if you don't know. Like, if you are curious, there's this thing called the internet that will tell you. I don't need to explain it to you. Like, you can work for that. Right. Right. Um, <laughs> right. So there's a little, you know, anger at the audience on my part, but it comes out in a subtle way. So. Yeah, right. Um, so this is both a question and kind of a comment. So you, your word very much centers, obviously, indigenous identity, indigenous history, and stories, emphasis on plural. I appreciate it doesn't push. You're not saying, oh, this is what it means to be indigenous. This isn't the indigenous history. It's rather these are these are various ways people are indigenous. These are their yeah. histories. Would you say that's fair? Is that you're you talked about it earlier? It's not a monolith, right? And even you're you very oh, yeah. much emphasize that this is not there's no one way to be indigenous, but all these these indigenous people happen to have something in common, and that's a deep seated trauma of some kind, but within it they still express it and relate to it differently. Is that fair to to yeah that way? yeah i um sometimes when i'm when i realize i'm sounding like i'm speaking for all native americans it's like okay the only indian i'm speaking for is this one mm -hmm. you know this is what i think and feel and see um so yeah there is like i said there are 500 and some unique native cultures on this continent in this country um and then there are all kinds of ways to be to be native. Um, and the experience of people who are raised in their community, on a reservation, in their culture, you know, deeply enmeshed, versus um, someone like me who wasn't, you know, was not unaware of native heritage, was not completely disconnected from it. Um, I'm the first generation of my family to not be, of that side of the family, to not be born in Sault Ste. Marie. My family goes back at least seven generations that we can trace in the same town, in the same space. Um, and Sault Ste. Marie is uh, one of, it's in the Ojibwe migration story, which is like sort of a foundational story of our tribe. Um, it's the fifth stopping place on migration. So our tribe originally, pre-contact, started on the East Coast, sort of maybe mm -hmm. in like Nova Scotia, and received a prophecy that said you have to move. People are coming and they'll destroy you if you stay here. So your people have to move. Journey to where the food grows on the water. And so this was a migration that probably took 500 years and it happened, started before Columbus arrived. Um, mm -hmm. And it was going up the St. Lawrence waterway. So Niagara Falls is a place where our people stopped and settled for a while. And the area near Detroit is another one. Um, so Sault Ste. Marie, the rapids at Sault Ste. Marie were the fifth stopping place where we settled for a while and then journey, you know, some of us obviously stayed, but the journey ends at Madeline Island, um, the west end of uh, Lake Superior, and the food that grows on the water is wild rice, which is sort of a foundational part of traditional diet. Um, so, yeah, we go way back. Um, and like I said, the migration story, it is a story, um, but it is history and it's fact too. So um, yeah, I mean, telling these stories I think matters. And yeah, I'm sorry. I feel like I drifted way off what you initially asked. Oh, no, you're, no, you're good. You're good. But you know what? There is that one way to be native um, and everybody is native enough. And I referenced earlier, there is a lot of identity policing that goes on. Um, I've encountered this at ISU, um, honestly, 
with when Tribe was founded um, just a few years ago. Tribe is the Native American student organization that started at ISU, I think, 2020, 20, uh, maybe 2021. Anyway, um, initially, there were some faculty who were, and I'm an advisor for Tribe along with Angela Haas, Dr. Angela Haas, who is a professor of English and uh, Eastern Band Cherokee. We are the sum total of Native faculty at ISU the moment. There's also another professor, Dr. Ellis Hurd, um, in the education department who is um, Mescalero Apache, and he was part of the piece as well. Um, so there's three, which is good. Not enough, but uh, anyway, when we were starting Tribe, uh, there was some talk among non-Native faculty who were sort of acting in an advisory capacity like, well, we don't, you know, it should just be limited to Native people and Tribal members and, uh, you know, and I had to stop them, and Angela did too. It's like, We'll let the, the students of tribe decide who can be in tribe because not everybody who is Indian is a member of a tribe is right. enrolled. Um, there are a lot of barriers to that because the record keeping was it, tribal membership usually depends on birth records and census and other sorts of data that are kept by white people and mm -hmm. have been designed over time to disenfranchise us. Yeah. Um, so like people who are Indian, there's no like litmus test for Indianness to be in tribe. I think that's important. There's all kinds of ways. Everyone is Indian enough. And certainly allies, you know. College is a time where um, a lot of people who heard the, you know, Grandma was the Cherokee princess story in their family um, start to explore that, you know, of, well, is that true? And what does that mean? And it is sort of shorthand for a joke. I mean, El Elizabeth Warren, uh, certainly her story, um, I never wanted to condemn her for that because it's like most people, that's all they have are stories. That's how it gets handed down. You don't always right. have records. And it's real hard to explain this to non-Native people. Um, I never heard other Natives condemn Elizabeth. Well, there's one um, <laughs> who's made it her career to out pretendians. Um, oh, right. Yeah. He's not too reputable. Um but otherwise, I never heard a Native person condemn Elizabeth Warren for thinking she's, and she, she had a, a, you know, ancestry test. I mean, there was Native heritage there, but, you know, there is the idea of what community claims you and what community you claim. And for some people, that link has been broken. And mm. I don't think it's, I don't think you can fault people for that. You know, I can't control what my grandparents, great grandparents, my ancestors did or why they did it. I had the reasons to maybe yeah. disavow being native. So Yeah. I mean, I, I know indigenous people, one in particular I won't name, went to school. I think he was like middle school, like really young, and was like, well, where they were talking about your family history, you know, just some activity they did with kids. He's like, well, I'm indigenous, or maybe he said I'm native. And the teacher's like, no, you're not. All the Indians are dead. Yeah. Right. And they're just like, and every once you have to be like, I don't blame people for not being so outward about their identity or their family having not been outward and suppressed it. Because what is the, how the experience of when it, when you come out as indigenous or you're known to be indigenous, like you talked about the boarding school system, the social. Yeah biases against you whether that's oh you're a dirt you know any insult that could be said or the tokenization of can i touch your hair which i have seen happen to my indigenous friends of the, the fetishization <laughs> of i don't have hair anyone's ever wanted to touch it's like, i wish i had that hair i don't have that hair so i got the wispy french hair you know we're a mix of uh french and anishinaabe so yeah i got the bad french mm -hmm. hair in the family <laughs> so oh but, yes exactly and you know um I grew up in Michigan. I went, grew up in Muskegon, Michigan, high school with a native mascot. But um, in recent years, you know, over, you reconnect with people from Facebook as you get, or, you know, from high school over Facebook, social media as you get older. I found out, like, I started posting things on Facebook about being native. I never denied it in high school, but I never identified that way either. And why would I? Um, but, like, two other people I went to high school with and was pretty good friends with, they're like, oh, yeah, we're Odawa. And, you know, uh, another was Potawatomi. None of us knew that about each other. And it probably yeah. would not have been cool, you know. Um, one of the women that uh, said, you know, when I started to post things about um, my tribe, she's like, yeah, we're, you know, we're Odawa. We're on the Durant roll, too. 
and she was you know the one of the like prettiest most popular you know girls in in all through school you know kind of um and i don't know in high school if she would have been forward about saying i'm you know has been proud of that because you know you're trying right. so hard to fit in you know Mm -hmm. you're not, and it's just one other way you could stay yeah out, it's like you know? oh yeah and be indian too so like. right right uh i want to say earlier you're talking about the the oh the the migration story and you're like that's both myth yeah i can't remember the term you it's both story and true yeah. it's history and myth or it's or or whatever yeah. term you want to use that reminds me i'll self-plug the podcast okay here. back to november of last year we did an interview with Dr. Paulette Steves, who is a Cree Métis woman from Canada, and she wrote a book called The Indigenous Paleolithic of the Western Hemisphere, and she talks about how so many of these stories, and this is only part of the overall book, but how often these stories are important to someone's identity, and that when these things are rationalized by Western anthropology, they're shoved on the rug, like, oh, it's just a story, it's ignorant people, you know, it's a bunch of myth, right? How impactful that is on a community, in that when indigenous people are raised with those stories being told, like all the pathologies people think of when they think of indigenous people, alcoholism, suicide rates, right? All of those, all of that stuff tends to be decreased. When people see themselves in their stories of their people, those, those, those social problems fade away. Right. Right. And so when you're talking about artwork and the importance of art, like your stories, like even just someone's own tribal or clan or whatever stories how important that is and so that just really reminded me because we, we did talk about that the social importance of having those stories yeah um my i i think i said earlier i just went to the um my my tribe had its 50th anniversary uh grand assembly is what they called it but i mean it's their powwow which they do every year but it was a bigger deal because it's 50th year and it was my first time going to it um i have i don't have any family left at sault ste marie i don't think i've been there in 20 years in that town um and it's you know like an, it was a 10-hour drive from here to get there so that's one reason uh we don't go much but um i went and it was really worth it but to see how much it has the the reservation and the community has changed um is really powerful they now have a k through eight school um you know teaching the language the language is being revived um but when i was a kid you know where the indians lived out on chunk road was awful you know it was a slum it was a bunch of shacks and trailers um it was terrible and now it's it's very nice you know they have a school and a community center and a healthcare center and a casino uh that we stayed in <laughs> but um it was really heartening to see that and that now it's you can be proud of being native and my grandfather and his family couldn't you know they had to hide it so that feels good um and part of the piece i did uh was about listening and being heard and some of the people who performed in it said that was the best part was being able to say these things in a form where people were listening to be asked those questions, you know, tell us about your people. Often um, people don't, either they don't know or they don't feel like they can ask or they don't want to appear, you know, they don't want to seem dumb or ignorant or say the wrong thing. But uh, that's how you learn is ask questions. <laughs> and I've never been insulted when someone's asked me, you know, tell me more about this part of your identity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's really great. Um, that sounded like really fake when I said it like that. I'm just trying to keep questions. I'm just trying to keep all my questions in order here. <laughs> it's all right. Um, so I have one last question for you. And this is one I was reading. It was a Redbird Scholar interview from last year. I think it's actually yeah. one in which you're talking about uh, reservation dogs. Um, and you said, social media is democratic. It gives people agency to tell their own stories. I really wanted to pick your brain on that because I actually I actually kind of disagree with that because I find that social media platforms with mm, their algorithms, yeah. their 
they're run by you know they're run by private interests that can as we see now like the most i know everyone wants to harp on it but twitter with elon musk right like he's i'm going to reestablish free speech but now like sis is a word that can get you like banned on the fucking app i have never you know i've never done twitter i'm just like i'm not getting in that mess <laughs> fair enough so i was wondering could you elaborate on what you mean by like it's democratic or it gives people agency i'm, I'm really curious on how you conceptualize oh. the notion of social media okay what I'm referring to there, because I, I hear you that um, it is not democratic in some ways. It's uh, you can create, right? Um, mm. And I'm kind of going back to Reservation Dogs, the 1491s, a lot of uh, native content like on TikTok, etc. Is It's democratic for the creator in some ways, the person making it, in that you just need a phone, right? You don't... Um, you don't have to have a camera or a studio or a whole lot to make the art. Mm. Um, so in that way, to, to, to put your story out there now to get it heard is another thing, right? And that is the realm of, you know, billionaires controlling algorithms, but um, you can put it out there. And there are like, obviously, like any other population, there are native, you know, circles on Facebook and TikTok, etc., um, so in that way, it is democratizing. And the way social media um, has been utilized by Native people to learn language and share culture is really important because a lot of Native you know, reservations or communities are very isolated from one another. And urban Native populations like Chicago, you know, that was created by the relocation policy. Of it's yep. people from many different tribes sort of dumped in the city and left to their own devices. You know, they were promised one thing by the government and not given much. So the Native community um, in Chicago, there is a cohesion to it, but they are people from many different tribes. And so if they want, you know, if someone is Menominee and they want to learn their language, they can connect to someone who is on the Menominee reservation and knows the language, you know. So in that way, in that way, it's it's democratizing. You have some agency as far as what you can do. But yes, I totally hear <laughs> it's not democratic in lots of other ways. Gotcha. Yeah, I just that stood out to me because I'm, you know, like I run this this uh, podcast and I'm and I online in certain spaces and I've just published right. a zine. And I've been kind of using online, but it's like it's also weird for me because it's like as someone who's really critical of technology, it's like that there's a lot of tension in doing this kind of thing. Cause even people that I'm like, Oh yeah, I run a podcast. that's anti-tech. And they looked at me and they're like, Come again? <laughs> and they're like, hold on, I need you to run that by me one more time. And I'm like, uh, you know, I mean, the thing is how many, and maybe you would agree with this. I'm really interested from a, the perspective of, of, of theater. But the, the thing is, is that we've been so atomized by social media or that even before social media, people are moving into the insular form right like more and more we've been atomized and that social media is kind of it's a lot harder to just go out and talk to people or sit you know sit out in public space and soapbox about stuff you know what i mean it's and even yeah. illegal in some cases right or shamed so it's like in some sense it's been taken away and i'm trying to with like my printed zine to do that work so i'm curious what is it you know do you see any relationship between that and some of the theater work or even particularly being indigenous this idea of like people being atomized and having no option but social media to kind of talk about their experiences uh yeah i mean is from the indigenous perspective um i what i the, a positive thing about social media is that it has helped connect communities like and facebook you know which is sort of like the old school uh of social media is really popular you know because a lot of it's a lot of older people you know in their communities or who are cut off from their communities reconnecting or conversing over that so that's a positive um as and i guess what i'm looking at in in that are things like for me like learning the language or hearing more about the culture or things you know issues that are affecting specific communities in the um with my tribe we are fighting um, an Enbridge pipeline that goes under the Straits of Mackinac. It's called Line 5, Enbridge Line 5. Mm -hmm. And it is a 70-year-old pipeline that was only supposed to last 50 years. And it's carrying oil under the Great Lakes. And if it ruptures, um, you know, the Great Lakes watershed is contaminated for good. And so, like, <laughs> we're fighting that. And it's, like, good to hear about that or to be able to, you know, sign on to things or endorse or spread, you know, the word about that. So... So that's a good thing with um with theater 
yes, there is a, and just with teaching, you know, people are so distracted with, and disengaged mm-hmm. with social media, with their phones. Um, and me too, you know, it, I kind of resisted it for a long time, but, um, you know, I'm as bad as anyone else. So it is hard to get people to engage. Um, and maybe you see this, you know, teaching also. Um, but I don't always think it's a bad thing. I think sometimes I've seen theater productions that are trying to like work social media into the production, and I kind of hate that. Honestly, I've seen, <laughs> um, it never works all that well, or it's just annoying. Um, it never works as well as you think it will, and it's kind of annoying. And not everybody. But they got a dream, you know. They got a dream. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and not everybody. I mean, when I've seen this in use not everybody has a good phone or good connectivity or is as adept or you know like so it's awful in some ways so i i don't love that but i don't condemn it i mean i've i taught a course in devising theater and this is another thing i do a lot of my work is sort of devised meaning it's not scripted it's sort of creating it in conjunction with the performer with the performers have a hand in the creation of the work so I taught a class in this, and the first time I did it was the first year we were totally online for the pandemic. So it was going to be a live class, and then it was online. So it's really hard to teach live performance over Zoom. But we did it, and we created a piece, um, a final project in the class, completely over Zoom, that it was a YouTube video was the end result. But it was all about life online in Zoom in the pandemic and the sense of disruption and disconnection. You know, it... it critiqued its own medium, which I kind of liked. Um, so, you know, I'm not anti-social media. I think there's definitely ways to engage with it in a, you know, in performance, as a performance. But I like live stuff, you know, <laughs> I like live human presence. Look yeah. me in the eyes. There's something about being in the being, space, right. right? Being there. Yes, when it's you're there when it happens and your physical presence matters, your attention. Yeah. And with Sunset on the Longest Day, that was one of the things is you had to be there and you had to be in it and your your body and your presence and what you focused on and the noises you made or whatever were mattered and impacted. So. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I mean, that's I think that's a really good way to put it. Um, I find there's a, a connection. There's a there is a weird loss of the live face to face i mean that just comes with some of my beliefs as they are right but like in theater right like i don't get to go enough to and i'm not into sports i'm not going up to watching sports and there's not i'm not as into theater i was a little bit more when i was in high school and early college uh i like to go see live music right but it's like there's something about being in those spaces with other people who are there maybe for the well, same reason like or maybe because music, oh it's my you know girlfriend. with live music if especially if it's like an artist you like and music you're familiar with it never it never sounds the same and often it doesn't sound that good live you know like it sounds much better on the record <laughs> on the recording but you know being there matters um of all the mm-hmm. concert i mean i've never been a huge concert goer but like i couldn't tell you what they played you know, like, did they play the song? I don't really remember. Right. I remember being in the crowd and, you know, the noise and, you know, the experience. And that's what was awesome about it. Um, so, yeah, the liveness is a thing. I'm so heartened that you're doing a zine. <laughs> that you're going back to print. That's nice. Yeah, I mean, no, I, there are so many zines I get. And they're saying they're like, and I'm not shitting on other people that do it, but they do like the... uh Oh, the program, like the layout programs, but mine's the typical oh. like cut and the old style cut and paste. This is... Um, and by the way, uh, it's it's okay. so good. It's I've sold like something like seventy of them okay. now, I think. And some of them are like international orders, like Ireland, New Zealand, Canada. It's been fucking awesome, which shows me people are still interested in that kind of like physical. You know, we. I'm in my fifties, uh, and so my. I remember a world before everyone had a phone in their hand all the time. <laughs> and, you know, I, people my age, I think, miss that sometimes where you had to talk to somebody or you had to call someone on the phone to get, I'm sorry, my phone is being. Oh, wow, wow. <laughs> what timing? <laughs> um, you know, uh, you had to have a conversation to get something done. And now mm-hmm. so much is, I'll send you a text 
or I'll send you an email. It's like, yeah, and nobody will read that. And then we'll text and then we'll wonder why it didn't happen. Um, so yeah, there's something kind of analog about the world that the human presence, even if it's over the phone, you know, that I miss. Mm -hmm. So I think in the zine thing, I mean, that was so big when I was in college as an undergrad. Um, yeah, it's cool. I'm glad you're doing it. Yeah. And I, I appreciate that. And I, I want to say before we wrap this up, I'll have to check it out. I will try to get a hold of it. Yeah. What is what's the plug your plug your zine? What's it called? It's called Plastic in Utero, a journal of anti civ anarchy reborn from the compost of wasteland modernity. It's a long one. It's a long name. Wow. Okay. I'll look it up. Oh, I will. Well, you won't find it online. I will get you a copy. Don't you oh. worry. Oh, okay. Uh, Great. I will get you one. To... Which is why. Check the description below for my P.O. box, and I will send you one if you send me $3 in the mail. Uh, <laughs> that's my plug. But let me say this. I want to say I appreciate the work that you do. Um, I've been to several of your of your, of your your productions, or whether or not you've written it, but you've produced it or, or something to that nature. I've been there, and it's always been, I can tell you, just so passionate about the work. And, it, you know, you're not there. You know, no one's a professor for the money, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, but I can tell you're there because you're interested in the work and the people you inspire something in the people that show up because there's always an emotional reaction among the people and people are interested in having conversations with you because every time I want to talk to you after everyone wants to talk to you I'm like well shit I can't get to them <laughs> well and you know this was nice usually talking right after a performance and I remember um, talking to you after um, Sunset and I think after the other show you're talking about it's like, yeah, I'm just exhausted. Like, yeah, sunset. You know, we had one perform, one rehearsal and one performance. That's just. But I have been living with that thing for months, and by the t and you're so worried. You know, it's so stressful, right? Mm -hmm. Trying to make sure the show goes right, and when you're the director or creator of it, you ha once it starts, you have no control. Not really. You know, you just hope they do <laughs> that. Everything goes like you wanted it to. So it's, you know, it's like taking your hands off the wheel of a speeding bus. Like, okay, hope this goes well. Can't do much about it. So, yeah, I always, everyone always wants to talk. And it's like, I just feel like I'm a babbling idiot at that point. Yeah, that's why when I was like, hey, because that's when I was like, you should come on the podcast. You look to me. I could see it in your eyes. You're like, you're what? <laughs> like, I just, there was something not quite, it wasn't the same Dr. Eplet that was there at the beginning of the production. <laughs> yeah, that person was exhausted, so... Uh, that's um, how that's how I feel yeah. after recording like one episode of this. My brain is just like fried because you have to do so. You know, there's so much attention back and forth. You yeah. know, which right. is great because exactly. now I get to record. I get to record another one after this in approximately two hours, and it'll be great. Uh, but you know, but yeah, I mean, this is the thing with live interaction. You know, um, even though we're on you know the dreaded social media, but we're having a conversation in real time. Mm -hmm. At least for us. I mean, everyone else is listening later. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, it. It exhausts you, but it also feeds you. You know, mm -hmm. that's the thing with live theater or music or just live human interaction. And we we get so far away from that. We've gotten so far away from that with social media, but also the pandemic, you know, um, as a teacher, being over Zoom, teaching over Zoom, and then coming back live, um, you really see students, you know, struggle sometimes to like, they don't know how to be present. Right. Um, in a class specifically. Um, so you kind of have to teach them. And I will sometimes in the midst of a class just sort of re reference somebody, you know, by name or call on someone and, and they're, you know, freaked out by it. And it's like, I'm just, you know, you seem to be looking at me. So I just said your name and, you know, you're here. I see you. So my favorite thing is uh, as a, as an English teacher, um, being like, if I can tell no one's listening, they're all on, you know, I'm sounding like a boomer for this, but if they're on TikTok or something and I'm like, let me get yeah. their attention, I'll just say random shit. I'll just say, you know, uh, the English language is fake. I've been lying to you and you've been pranked. And like a kid yeah. will look up and be like, what did you say? Oh, uh -huh. <laughs> and it, it just, or some stupid shit like that. So it's, I've been lying to you this entire semester. It's made up. There is no such thing as grammar, which you can argue there technically isn't, but you know, um, your grade actually isn't worth anything. I also, though, um, I used to be a real hard ass in class about put your phones away. I mean, I, pre pandemic, I was like that. And then afterwards, once we, you know, came back to, you know, normal, whatever that is, but 
I just gave up on that. It's like, if you want to be on your phone, I'm just glad you're in the room, you know? And, and I realized like, um, in college, right. I, uh, and I was teaching like upper level college courses that I'm referring to. I might not do this with freshmen, but, um, a lot of my students were like fact checking me or looking stuff up or I'd reference some play or film and they'd want to know more about it. It's like, well, that's good. Like that's productive right. distraction. <laughs> like, right. So I kind of let them do it. And then it's also, um, you become, I've become much more aware of, um, people's anxieties and things, you know, social anxiety, is, I think is a much bigger thing with college students now that if it makes them feel better to, you know, have their phone in their hand and be scrolling through whatever they're scrolling through. Okay. You know, I'm not going to fight it. It's they're here you know, and that's half the battle. So, mm -hmm. so I, yeah. I think sometimes it's a comfort, you know, it's, it's another channel for people to be in and we're so used to multitasking and being on several things at once that maybe some people operate better that way. I don't know. Mm -hmm. For me, I, you know, I, I, I have tension with that because I have a thing where I can collect phones if I want to, mm. I try not to, cause I am like, I don't want to be an authoritarian asshole about it, but sometimes it's like, yeah. So I sometimes like the I mean I've had kids, uh students rather I should say. Yeah, like, you know, I, I appreciate Yeah, I, I appreciate that you that you talked about this. You know, I've actually because we did a a, a a lesson. This is a total fucking off the rails from everything else, but this is okay. Um I had a we uh we had a unit on media bias, mm -hmm. and part of that was how much time do you spend on your phone yeah. and the, the phone tracker. I spend on average maybe three hours on my phone a day, uh -huh. um, like total, uh, which is apparently far below the average, which is really scary to think about. But then I have some of my students who are seniors. They're like, oh, five, seven, yeah. eight, ten hours. And I'm like, holy fuck. That's crazy. Yeah. Um, yeah I so, mean, and we talk about that. It's become, I mean, it's easy to do, you know, every. Mm hmm. It's like, oh, I just, even if it's like, I need to know what time it is. And it's like, oh, look, I have a message. And, oh, you know. And you get pulled in. And then that's the thing with the algorithms I was talking about earlier is they're built to do that to you. Yeah. They're built to do that because they want your data and they're selling it. So the more you engage with it, the more you feed into it, you know, and it's <laughs> not, it's, yeah, it's not healthy. But like a lot of my students are like, I appreciate you talked about this. I, I've, I deleted this app, usually yeah. TikTok. I know, I know. Or, oh, I've reduced my phone use by this much or because I when I'm with them, like I put my phone like it's gone, like I hide it in my desk. And if I'm if I don't want to do anything, if I don't want to do anything and they're working or we're just chilling in class, you know, I'm handwriting something because I'm usually plotting episodes or essay ideas at work yeah. or zines, uh, printing zines off at work. It's fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, they don't pay me enough, so you know I'm just taking what I uh, what what I deserve. Yeah. Or like you know, or I'm reading, which is to me a modeling behaviors I want to see people engaged in. Yeah. Exactly. You know, it's great. But that's just me. That's just me. So I guess we can we can round it out here because that was a fucking tangent, which I didn't anticipate, okay. but I appreciate I mean, it. I really you'll I, I I expect you'll edit this into some more <laughs> coherent form or. Oh, it's all up to, it's up to the gods, which by that I mean is my editor who is awesome. Okay. And he, he is the unsung hero of this show. So I'll ask this before we round off. Is there any way for people to support you or the work that you do or the work of other people around you? Um, I, well, the, okay. Ruth K. Burke's piece, domestic rewild, domestic rewilding is this is the land art piece out at the um, ISU Horticulture Center on Rab Road across from the corn crib. You can go and see that. It'll be under construction and in, in progress for a couple of years. Um, she also, you can volunteer um, at the Horticulture Center to, to work on it or uh, with Ruth directly. Um, Ruth K. Burke, if you look her up online, you'll find a website. I don't actually have a website of my own, and that's one thing I've been meaning to do. But, um, yeah, I mean, just stay tuned, I guess. <laughs> I don't have uh, right. We're being kept on our toes here. Yeah i I don't have like a upcoming performance project specifically. Um, so mm -hmm. yeah, I'm I'm also like I said a theater history scholar, and I'm supposed to be writing a chapter on a um, female theater maker from Chicago, 
uh, in Chicago history. And that's due in November, so I need to do that um, to get to work on that. But that's a, that'll be a reading thing, not a performance. And it's not about indigenous stuff. So, yeah, just stay tuned. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't have, like I said, a specific thing coming up, but hopefully I will. I'd like to do something like Sunset on the Longest Day again in, you know, and work with people on writing the text for it using um, sort of the template I made. And I think um, the template, I mean, it wouldn't have to be indigenous, right? I think you could do this with right any sort of community. It could be really powerful um, in lots of different ways because you could develop a text and then perform it and I think the moving audience idea has a lot of interesting applications or potential so but I don't have anything specific coming up so I'm sorry stay tuned no no you're good you're good you're just keeping us on our toes I see too usually I mean it's interesting you're one of our more um unique guests in so far we the people who tend to bring on are like political I, I'll say activists in a broad sense though most of them probably wouldn't use that term that's uh that's your focus and that's great um yeah but it's still interesting because you brought a different perspective like the way you've engaged with the podcast is different than most people because they come in like their experience with this type of like conversation or like audience but you bring a very different perspective you know what i mean and i find i appreciate that a lot and i hope the audience does as well really well i i did somebody's this is really the first podcast i've done um i did one it was I don't know if it, I don't know whatever happened to it. I never saw it. Um, I'm not sure the person who was doing it knew what they were doing. But uh, yeah, this was really fun. And Or I've done, you know, I did some press and radio interviews related to um, Sunset on the Longest Day. But uh, yeah, this was fun. This was really engaging and focused. And you, you and I'm, you know, I'm not, I guess the thing with doing, you know, like a radio interview about an upcoming show is you're promoting something really specific. And the thing is over with now. So I can just talk about what it was and how it played out. And that's, that's cool. I, um, as a director, you don't often get to do that. And then to think about it, I mean, you've pushed me to think about it. Um, uh, I mean, I wouldn't say political. Well, yeah, I mean, it is sort of the political activist end of it. which. I don't always go about quite as consciously. Um, I didn't have a, you know, specific uh, political end in mind with doing the piece. It was just like, y'all need to hear this. You can do with it what you want to do as, you know, the spectator, but you need to know this. You need to hear this. You need to feel this. And then maybe you'll Mm -hmm. act differently or do differently. You hope so, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's not just art on its own. It's art with the purpose of inspiring. Yeah, and actually, right? you I, want to tell here's, here's the political end of it with um, traditional theater. I've been teaching in, you know, ISU's theater program. Uh, often, and I've been thinking about this more in the broader context of, like, theater today, um, is theater, and there was just an article out about this sort of critiquing old school 20th century theater, you know, you sit there and you watch this play we wrote and shut up and, you know, but um, art needs to engage people and it needs to change and it needs to do that um, in a, in a different way, you know, Um, after the, with George Floyd, the joke in theater circles was, well, what Shakespeare do we do that addresses, you know, institutionalized racism? You know, I mean, we go back to, and then, you know, we'll do the same old Shakespeare again and maybe add some props or do something we'll set it in you know some dystopian future it's like that he wasn't writing about this stuff you know he wasn't speaking to this audience so we need to do different things and engage people differently right i've been thinking about that a lot right and you made me think rethink through that devising class where we had to be online and create a final piece that Mm -hmm. was very different and that really stretched me um, that was a good exercise to have to do. You know, this is the circumstances we're in. How do we make art out of this? So that was a good thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I pre. I mean, the po- I always hope the podcast is yeah. like a two-way street, right? It can not only does it bring a, something content, right, but it gets me thinking about things. And I would hope it. You know, I ask questions that engages yeah. the guests. No, you totally. Yeah, like, you do totally. They were really good. And you did some homework. I mean, I love how yeah, you're. Well, um, you quote an interview I did with Redbird Scholar, and it's like, 
yeah i don't i kind of remember saying that but um yeah and you made me think about it differently because yeah social media is not democratic <laughs> so yeah i do do my homework i spend more time researching guests on this and I, I i do deep dives sometimes so i can ask because it's especially if someone does we've had some people on that have that are popular esque in our spaces yeah. so i'm like i don't want to just ask the same question they've been asked on every other platform yeah. you know what i mean i want it to be like useful thought yeah. questions. well good um yeah, so this was great thank you very much for having me yeah so this has been uncivilized with dr shannon epplett thank you for listening great